Oh, 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 damn, oh, damn, get, get him some ointment, oh, shit. When you think of a terrible person, you may think of a serial killing rapist who also teaches at your neighborhood preschool, or maybe the doctor that gives you a colonoscopy on the weekends, but there are people far worse than that, especially in film, and today, I'm going to talk about one of those people, someone so viciously, incorruptibly psychotic that he supersedes almost anyone else ever put in a movie. The person I'm referring to is of course Commander Pinbacker, played by Mark Strong in Danny Boyle's 2007 sci-fi horror, Sunshine. I know it may have been a while since you've seen Sunshine, the movie, not the, uh, yeah, yeah, not, not that. If you hadn't seen that kind of Sunshine, then I'd guess you were a vampire. Motherfucker. Anyway, if you haven't ever seen the film Sunshine, then I invite you to do so because it's one of my favorite science fiction movies, offering incredible acting from Cillian Murphy, Chris Evans, and Rose Byrne. Tense and dramatic sequences, along with a heart-pounding score, so I'm sure if you watch it, you'll enjoy it too. In an effort to remind you what this underseen and underappreciated film is about though, if you have seen it, let me give you a brief synopsis and provide some important background information for why Pinbacker is so despicable and perhaps the worst person I've ever seen on screen. The yes is just the crest, expressing myself the best. The recipe for death is testing me. I'm the next to be pressing heavy heat up on your chest until you rest in peace. Let the lesson be, don't mess with me unless you want your dome piece blown into the chest of peace. Sunshine chronicles the story of Icarus 2, a space vessel carrying a very large... Wait, what were they carrying again? We have a payload to deliver to the heart of our nearest star. We're delivering that payload... Our payload. Payload delivery. Okay, payload delivery point reached. The velocity of the payload... There's not gonna be another payload. We have a payload to deliver. A payload, singular. That payload is an extra payload. Oh, oh, okay. So, Icarus 2 carried a massive payload designed to fix the sun which had apparently been dying for the past few years, leaving the Earth and all of its inhabitants in looming peril. In an effort to prevent the decimation of human society and nearly all life on Earth, scientists from several countries, including the United States, Japan, and France, came together to construct a device that could hopefully reignite the most important celestial body to us. As I'm sure most of you know, the sun is essential, an indisputable necessity for the well-being of everything on this planet. And do you know what'll happen if they fail? We die. Everything dies. Uh, thanks Chris. Uh, from the heat it radiates to the light it generates, the sun, without question, forms an unyielding vice to the testicles of this planet, holding the Earth's present and future in its hands. So, the people of Earth understanding this imminently disastrous situation sent Icarus II, the second vessel aiming to replenish the sun's vitality and effectiveness, to hopefully save everything. However, as you may already be aware, while the movie primarily focuses on the mission of Icarus 2, Pinbacker, one of the most reprehensible but, up to this point in the film, still unrevealed people in science fiction, had already begun fully unraveling into a deep, inconsolable darkness and disillusion on the ship he commanded, Icarus 1, the first vessel humanity had sent to the sun. And here's where we start to understand the depth of Pinbacker's insanity. My God! As I emphasized earlier, humanity heavily relies on the sun, with each living creature either directly or indirectly using its energy to survive. So an incomprehensibly large amount of trust, more than anyone else in history, was bestowed upon those aboard either Icarus vessels. Although there was no guarantee that the payload they were carrying would even work, these crew members were still trusted to operate with integrity and be willing to sacrifice their lives for the trillions of creatures on this planet. They were trusted to fulfill their duty and, at the very least, not abandon mission and let every fucking person on the planet die. <sighs> Which is why Pinbacker's actions are so deplorable. Not only does he sabotage his own vessel, knowing full well that a failure to complete the mission would soon result in the deaths of nearly every living being on the planet, but he also convinces his crewmates to expose themselves to the full brightness of the sun, indirectly causing the deaths of several people who most likely hold a deep and personal trust in him after having lived with the man aboard a solitary space vessel far away from home for a while and presumably after a few months or maybe even years of careful planning and preparation for such a dangerous yet important mission. In his first appearance in the film, we hear him make his proclamation. We have abandoned our mission. All our hopes, our, our dreams are foolish. We are just nothing more. It is not our place to challenge God. 
Now you might be asking, so why'd he do it? He told me to take us all to heaven. Wait, 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 wait. Let's 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 hold on a second, Pinbacker. I'll come back to that. First, let me explain the rest of Pinbacker's story before I try to psychoanalyze it. Like I said earlier, Pinbacker was a member of Icarus 1, but Sunshine follows Icarus 2. So what happened after he and his crewmates abandoned their mission? Well, somehow, drifting alone on a ship in the endless pitch black void of space, Pinbacker survived for more than six years as the Earth prepared a second Icarus vessel carrying another payload. However, this time, there wouldn't be another chance. Icarus 2, along with the payload it carried, was their last hope. Their last chance of saving Earth from seemingly inevitable destruction. There's not going to be another payload. The one we carry is our last chance. Our last, best hope. Which brings us to the start of the film. I'll skip over most of the plot, seeing as this is a video mostly dedicated to explaining the insanity of Pinbacker, who doesn't arrive until nearly the end of the movie, creating an unexpected tonal shift. So, as the crew of Icarus 2 continues moving towards the sun along their journey, they discover a transmission sent by Icarus 1, and, more specifically, by Pinbacker, who presumably was leading them into a trap. Unaware of Pinbacker's corrupted and twisted mentality, the crew, after much deliberation amongst themselves, decides to shift their trajectory in order to receive Icarus 1's payload, which, regrettably, is where they run into Pinbacker. The crew believed that picking up Icarus 1's payload would double their chances of a successful mission because, as Kappa explains, Two last hopes are better than one. As the crew make their way back to Icarus 2 after boarding Icarus 1 in search of supplies and to test the functionality of its operating systems, one of them makes an unsettling discovery. Pinbacker has also reboarded Icarus 2. Icarus. Yes. Who's the fifth crew member? Being one of the most haunting scenes in the film, it follows up the tension unleashed from the stunning revelation in the previous sequence by fully revealing Pinbacker's presence as he begins sabotaging Icarus 2, presumably in a way similar to his own ship Icarus 1. Of course, chaos ensues as the remaining crew members of Icarus 2 realize that Pinbacker ruined his own mission and is attempting to do so again, even if that means killing everyone aboard the ship. He doesn't do so quietly either. He feels inclined to make some unwarranted remark right before or after killing his victim. Like this. Look, even the camera can't stay in this man's face. After having fully dedicated himself to once again destroying humanity's hopes and dreams, Pinbacker begins violently surging for the remaining crew members. In an effort to sabotage another Icarus vessel, he removes the ship's computer mainframes from the cooling tanks, one of several steps in preventing the crew from reviving the sun. By doing this, Pinbacker once again embarks on a steadfast quest of letting humanity perish because as he claims, Inevitably though, he ends up failing. Due to the bravery of several crew members, Pinbacker's plan, rather than Icarus 2, is sabotaged. The remaining crew members band together and thwart Pinbacker's attempts at stopping them, leading to the eventual revival of the sun and a bright future for Earth and all of its inhabitants. Doesn't that just make you happy? No. However, although humanity ends up defeating Pinbacker, he does not get a pass for his vile actions. So, now that I've given a fairly brief rundown on Pinbacker's backstory, it's time to flame him, even more than he already has been. This man, Commander Pinbacker, took it upon himself to embark on a mission meant to save the uncountable number of life forms on this planet. The only planet up to this point in human history known to have any significant life at all. So he may have planned to extinguish all life in the universe, if life is a quality unique to Earth, but he apparently didn't care. He, along with his crewmates aboard Icarus 1, who are certainly also at fault here, decimated humanity's first hope at continued survival. But that just wasn't enough for the Commander. He waited. For years. I'm not sure whether he and his crewmates agreed that one of them would stay back, knowing that humanity would eventually send a second ship, or if Pinbacker simply decided to stay back on his own, but that really doesn't matter. Either way, Commander Pinbacker held such a strong, unwavering belief in this idea that he had proclaimed himself that he felt that sabotaging Icarus 1 was not enough. He needed a complete decimation and utter annihilation of humanity because, as he put it, So what makes Commander Pinbacker so much worse than most of the other horrendous sci-fi villains? At least he had a reason, even though that reason may have only been justifiable to him and his crewmates. Why'd I claim that he's one of the worst people to ever appear in a movie? 
Well, it's because although Commander Pinbacker held such strong beliefs, and I admit that a person with motivations as strong as Pinbacker's can be compelling, he tried to destroy countless lives. It's even possible that Pinbacker may have concocted this maniacal plan from the beginning, before even launching into space. It's possible that he knew he'd end up abandoning his mission, and that he knew the Earth would eventually send a second vessel. So, perhaps, Pinbacker even planned to wait alone for years for that second vessel, drifting alone in space, waiting for his opportunity to attack and end humanity's last hope at survival. And that, to me, is absolutely absolutely, unequivocally, insane. You're goddamn right. More than any xenomorph, more than any predator, any clone, any giant spider, Commander Pinbacker had become disillusioned with the world. He held what to most people, in most situations, is an admirable trait. Determination. The only problem though is that that determination was used for such despicable acts. My God! As he attempts to kill the last surviving Icarus 2 crew members and complete his personal, twisted, unflinching mission of sabotaging humanity's last hope, he explains that he was going to condemn everything on Earth to death. He just needed some light conversation to get him there. For seven years, I spoke with God. In the end, Pinbacker is an interesting case. He attempted to kill everything he had ever known because he, along with the rest of his crew, had gone insane. Perhaps I can't even blame the man. Maybe drifting alone in space and witnessing firsthand the incredible, endless void warped his mind and condemned him to such an inviolable path. Who's to say that under similar circumstances the same wouldn't happen to me? But that's still no excuse. Commander Pinbacker caused so much anguish and attempted to end the hopes, aspirations, and dreams of every human on the planet, along with nearly every other living creature. His warped perception prevented him from seeing the flaws in his ideology, leading him down an unstoppable path of destruction more impactful than nearly all other sci-fi villains, not just for the sheer unforgivable number of lives he attempted to forsake, but also for his demented personality and unyielding determination to accomplish such a horrifyingly dreadful goal. After all that, I bet they wish they would have done some psychiatric tests beforehand. Thanks for watching. Because you're flying into the sun!